Hello again, fellow Mystery Files. Today I bring you something a little out of the norm, a review of the classic mystery series, Murder, She Wrote, which premiered on September 30th, 1984, 40 years to the day this video is coming out. And I've seen comments from people wanting a video like this. I've seen a lot of praise for the show, and I love it. No, I will say I don't find the individual mysteries to be like, that clever, but that doesn't really matter for a TV episode, which are just supposed to be a lot of fun, and they are for the most part. And there are some duds, but we don't have to worry about those. You know, the show ran for 12 seasons and ended in 1996. There were four follow-up TV movies, video games, a book series that is still running, much to my chagrin. You know, they should put that series out of its misery, but I'll get into that later. But this series remains really an iconic TV show. You know, it's widely viewed on syndication. People of all ages are fans. It's still making new fans. You know, I've seen on TV, on all kinds of channels and streaming services, it's still insanely popular. But before I get into the thick of things, make sure you like and subscribe to keep up to date with the channel. I think Murder, She Wrote has a bit of misconception about it. I think people think of this as sort of a cozy TV series, and yeah, it is, you know, purely on the vibes, but Murder, She Wrote is definitely the series you watch, you know, snuggled up in a blanket drinking hot cocoa on a winter's evening, but I think in terms of, like, actual content of the mysteries, this is not really, like, a true cozy. You know, the content varied so much from episode to episode, and I love that about the show. And yeah, you do have these, like, cozier, simpler mysteries without a lot of substance to them, but next week you might have a more traditional, you know, cerebral puzzle mystery and the episode after that could be like an adventure thriller or a jewel heist or a globetrotting spy adventure or a communist plot behind the iron curtain i mean you never knew what kind of mystery you were going to get i think the show always did a good job and a co good competent job at the story they were telling i don't necessarily think every episode was genius or clever but again i don't really assess tv series in the same way i would a book you know i would not tolerate such things from a novel i expect more from novels but this series was created by three men peter fisher richard levinson and william link who created the Jim Hutton Ellery Queen series, and you can definitely see the influence in the first season especially. Those first episodes do feel very much like they could have been Ellery Queen stories because they were, you know, some of them were unused scripts from the Jim Hutton series. And these men created Jessica Fletcher, our heroine, to be this alleged combination of Miss Marple and Agatha Christie, which, eh... I don't see it that way, to be honest. You know, there's this trend to call any middle-aged or older female sleuth a Miss Marple, which, you know, I think demeans Miss Marple and is a fundamental misunderstanding of that character. I don't see really many similarities between Jessica Fletcher and Miss Marple. And to be fair, there are some. You know, they both live in a allegedly quiet villages where many bad things happen. They live alone, modestly, when they have other means. They both have nieces and nephews and friends teeming all over the place. But I think personality-wise, they are very different. Jessica Fletcher is far more active an investigator. You know, she sometimes breaks into rooms and goes undercover as a prostitute in one episode. You know, Miss Marple is just far more passive and only takes to active means when absolutely necessary. I don't really see a lot of Agatha Christie and Jessica Fletcher either. I mean, they're both mystery writers and women. Personality-wise, I don't see it either. You know, there is a lot of Ellery Queen and Jessica Fletcher. You know, they too are both mystery writers, very sociable and popular people, but also love to reflect inwardly and think. They are somewhat introverted, and they love their typewriters. Yes, Jessica used a typewriter for most of the series, Ron. She did eventually get a computer, and I think Angela Lansbury was a natural choice for Jessica Fletcher. I mean, the creators specifically had her in mind, but you know, she wasn't really a television actress, and Angela Lansbury has... You know, previous, you know, experience in detective mysteries. She played the cigarette smoking Miss Marple just a few years earlier in The Mirror Cracked, and she was also Salome Otterborn in Death on the Nile. You know, Angela Lansbury really nails this role. I mean, to me, this is her most iconic role of her entire career. 
All right, I'm going to go season by season, sort of, and run down what I, and call out some, like, my favorite and least favorite episodes of the series. Season one is definitely has that, like, early installment weirdness where the show's canon had not been firmly established. We don't have the full universe we know and love. We do have Amos Tupper, played by Tom Bosley, Kabakov's sheriff for the first few seasons. You know, I really liked Amos Tupper, although I, I do prefer the second sheriff, Mort Metzger. We also have Grady who played by Michael Horton. Grady is Jessica's nephew via her late husband, Frank. And, you know, he's the lover, lovable loser of sorts. No good hearted, but something of adult. And it is Grady who starts the show going when he submits a manuscript his aunt Jessica wrote without her permission. It was just something he did as she wrote after retiring as an English teacher. And the publishing company accepts the manuscript and a career as a mystery writer is born almost overnight. The pilot episode, The Murder of Sherlock Holmes, is such a good episode. It's a great introduction to the characters in the series. My favorite episode from season one is My John He Lies Over the Ocean, where Jessica helps her niece get over her husband's suicide on a cruise. That episode, you know, very much pulled from the Ellery Queen Thinks He's God era. Uh, Sun and Death is a fun episode where Jessica inherits a football team for some reason. Murder Takes the Bus is also pretty good. You know, I have to call out here Capital Offense as one of my least favorite episodes in the series. You know, I just hate this episode. The series is full of continuity errors and, you know, isn't well researched, to be honest, in terms of, like, real-life events and facts. But this episode is so egregious in which Jessica somehow gets appointed to the House of Representatives, which cannot happen and is just ridiculous anyway. You cannot be appointed to the House. And not only that, she assumes the duties of the previous congressman, including his seniority and chair of a committee, which takes decades to establish. You know, it's, it's so egregious, it drives me insane. I don't know why they did this, and the plot is just ridiculous anyway. Season 2 starts establishing a lot of the canon as we know it. Dr. Seth Hazlitt appears, played by William Wyndham, who played another character in Season 1, actually. We get Jerry Orbach as the private investigator, Harry McGraw, who has spun off into his own show. Len Carreyou appears for the first time as Michael Haggerty, the British spy. We meet Jessica's Irish performing cousin, Emma McGill, also played by Angela Lansbury. And I should say these recurring characters, like, aren't actually on the show as often often as I think you would assume, and certainly not as often as I would have liked. You know, the Cabot Cove people, you know, like the sheriffs and Dr. Hazlitt, are really only in the episode set in Cabot Cove. Occasionally, they go elsewhere. You know, for example, Dr. Hazlitt is only in 52 episodes out of 264. And I do think the episodes set in Cabot Cove are definitely the better episodes by and large. And my favorite season two episode is quite possibly my favorite of the series in Keep the Home Fries Burning, where a bunch of people get poisoned at a breakfast inn. I actually find it really clever and delightful. You know, I do think a lot of these plots aren't always the greatest in terms of, like, actual mechanics. And the show has this habit of giving the audience very obvious close-ups of important clues that were supposed to be subtle. You know, I don't think any of these mysteries are, like, the greatest mystery ever created, but this series is just so much fun as a whole, it doesn't really matter. Season 3 is where I think the show really starts climbing to its peak. The premiere is the classic episode of Death Stalks the Big Top with Courtney Cox pre-friends. I know that's a popular two-parter episode with the fans. You know, we have so many good episodes, like one after the other here. You know, the previous two seasons, and especially the later ones, do have some duds. You know, we have the Magnum P.I. crossover event this season. I'm a big fan of Magnum P.I. as well. Crossed Up is a very good episode inspired a little bit by, like, Rear Window, where Jessica's stuck in bed during a storm and her phone wires get crossed up and she overhears a murder plot. You know, she needs Dr. Hazlitt and Grady to help her, but they're both very bad at it. Another fantastic episode is The Days Dwindle Down, which is something of a sequel to the real-life film Strange Bargain, which is very good. You know, I love this episode and I love the creativity of it. This episode picks up 30 years approximately after the events of the film, and Jessica is approached with solving that murder. You know, the episode uses clips from the film, and much of the original cast returns. It's very well done. There, there, there are a few inconsistencies, but this is a very good episode, and it's very unique in execution. Season 3 is just full of very good episodes, but it is also home 
to an unfortunate occurrence. It's home to the first of these, I'm not really sure what to call them, I guess filler episodes where Jessica doesn't really appear. And over time, these become much more common, unfortunately. You know, Angela Lansbury was getting older and she wanted to step back a bit. So they would develop these like filler episodes that were mostly Jessica just sitting in a chair and tying the plot of one of her novels with all these other new characters. They weren't very good at all. I mean, the first of these, you know, in season three is Murder in a Minor Key, which is probably the best of these filler episodes, to be honest. You know, on occasion, these filler episodes would also focus on the adventures of, like, recurring characters in Jessica's absence, which, again, don't know why they did this. I mean, I know why they did this, but it, it wasn't very good. But season four continues this great streak. You know, this is the last full season with Amos Tupper before Tom Bosley left to play Father Dowling. And we also start seeing a little expansion of the Cabot Cove populace. You know, we meet Mayor Sam Booth, who is an idiot. And we also have, like, Eve Simpson, the real estate agent, and Loretta Spiegel, who owns the beauty parlor. You know, it's around this time I think Cabot Cove starts taking on its own personality as the murder capital of the world. You know, we start seeing it a little more than we had previously, especially more more about its history and like Joshua Peabody who's like this like revolutionary war figure and you know those new like female characters are very reminiscent of Miss Marple's gossipy friends like you know Miss Hartnell and Mrs. Price Ridley when Thieves Fall Out is an excellent episode and one of the best in terms of like actual execution and plot it's a lot of fun that's not that's the one where like there's like the group of friends involved in some like past shady activity and one of them returns to Cabot Cove feeling betrayed we have if it's Thursday it must be Beverly an all-time great episode I could watch this episode again and again you know this is the one where the mailman you know gets around so to speak and there's like a lottery fever sweeping Cabot Cove it's fantastic who threw barbiturates in Mrs. Fletcher's chowder is another really funny episode where Sheriff Tupper's family comes to visit. Benedict Arnold Slept Here is another Cabot Cove set gem. This season is full of like really good Cabot Cove mysteries. You know, we have just another fish story, which is not set in Cabot Cove, but another very good mystery and also introduces us to Donna, who would later become Grady's wife. She's played by Debbie Zip, who is the real-life wife of Michael Horton. So Grady and Donna are a real-life couple, and I believe they are still married. Unfortunately, this season it has one of the worst episodes in Indian Giver, which is set in Cabot Cove and is incredibly offensive with its portrayal of Native Americans. I'll say no more. If you've seen the episode, you know what I'm talking about. Season 5 continues to climb upward. This is the season where Mort Metzger arrives, played by Ron Masak, who also appeared in a previous episode as a different character, but he was also a New York City police officer there, which is funny. You know, he debuts in this really great episode called Mr. Penroy's Vacation, where these elderly women bury their dead tenant in the backyard so they can collect his pension check. That is not a spoiler, but Sheriff Metzger is this tough, like, New York City detective who thinks Cabot Cove is going to be a breeze in a vacation, and nothing happens there ever. You know, very much Raymond West's opinion of St. Mary Mead, but of course he's horribly wrong. Cabot Cove is much deadlier than the most dangerous neighborhood in the Big Apple. And we have the flight of the Dixie Damsel, which goes into the past of Jessica's late husband Frank. Something Borrowed, Something Blue is a great episode where Grady and Donna get married and Donna's housekeeper is murdered at the wedding. It causes all these disasters because naturally that's what happens when Grady is, is involved. The Sins of Castle Cove, for me, is in contention for my favorite episode. One of Jessica's former students returns to town after writing this, like, really trashy novel that's clearly based on, like, the real people in town. It's absolutely delightful. And starting with season six, I think this is where we start declining in quality a little bit. Angela Lansbury wanted to retire after season five, but she agreed to continue. But they do start upping the number of filler episodes here. Now, I think the good episodes here are still really good. I still think season six is like, you know, in the prime of murder she wrote. But they do, you know, these good episodes do start gradually becoming fewer and fewer as the years go on. You know, I don't have any, like, really particular favorite from this season. Town Father is pretty good, where this woman comes to town claiming the mayor is the father of her children. But we do get a lot of filler episodes, like the Szechuan Dragon, which is really about Grady and a pregnant Donna. You know, murder according to Maggie, and 
others just, just like aren't very good you know we get an increase of harry mcgraw episodes and michael haggerty and dennis stanton the cat burglar which are not particularly good because jessica's taking a back seat as uh, season six is not my favorite i, I will say I, I think most episodes here are at least watchable as in later seasons some of them just become very boring and stale so at least there's that Season 7 is more of the same thing. I don't think it's, like, as bad as Season 6. You know, we have A Body to Die For, which is a good episode where a famous fitness guru comes to Cabot Cove and swindles old ladies. Uh, this is also the plot of one of the book series that's pretty bad, actually. But I should also say, a few of these episodes very clearly inspired books in the Murder, She Wrote novel series, almost all of which are worse than the episodes, but they're not direct novel adaptations. Moving Violation is a good episode where Moore arrests the son of a rich man and becomes the target of this, like, corrupt intimidation scheme. Who Killed J.B. Fletcher is a fun episode where Jessica encounters this club of women who play detective in their local town, and one of them gets murdered while using Jessica's identity. And the sheriff thinks, like, Jessica was murdered, and it's all announced on the news that she died. Uh, this season definitely had higher highs than the previous ones, but it, too, is littered with filler episodes. And a lot of, like, Dennis Stanton and Michael Haggerty that I just didn't care for. Now, even the ones where Jessica does appear got very thrillery. And while these can be fun at times, they just really weren't here. But I, I would say Season 7 is better than Season 6 overall. Season 8 is a return for the better. You know, a brief reprieve before this, like, rough end stretch. You know, this is, like, the last hurrah for the show, in my opinion. This is the first season with Lewis Hertham as Deputy Andy Broom who replaces Mort's other deputy, Floyd, who, quite frankly, I found a lot more fun, as he was kind of a dunce. You know, I'm not necessarily a big fan of this plot of the season where Jessica temporarily locates to New York to take a teaching position, uh, but there are some good episodes here. You know, luckily this arc doesn't really last too long. Night Fears, where Jessica confronts a mugger on the campus, is good. Of course course of these episodes you know Jessica learns how to use a computer which is like a running plot that's really funny to me Thicker Than Water is a good episode that sees Mort reunited with his estranged brother The Witch's Curse is a fun one about you know witches in Cabaco. There are some good ones in this season, but between Jessica and New York and the move away from Cabaco, I do think the show really jumps the shark here. It didn't feel like Murder, She Wrote anymore, although I do think some of the episodes were still good. It just like what aren't what you would expect from Murder, She Wrote. Seasons 9, 10, and 11, to me, like, just don't have a lot going on for them. I don't particularly care for them much. I don't really have too many favorites out of this season's. Uh, there's a lot of Jessica around the world with Michael Haggerty and those recurring characters who are fine, but I think they were getting a little too much attention in my opinion. I felt the show really begins to deviate from its original concept and appeal to like a wider audience, which does not materialize and winds up losing its original audience. And when there aren't doing these thriller, you know, international ones, the episode plots get stale and are often repetitive of previous episodes. Season 10's Virtual Murder was pretty fun, though. This is the one where Je one of Jessica's books is turned into a video game and she starts to lose uh, like virtual reality devices, which is really funny. But generally, the plots to me just like aren't interesting or memorable. I don't really like any of these episodes. You know, one of the other problems is that even the ones set in Cabot Cove eliminate most of the supporting cast, only keeping the big players like Mort Metzger and Dr. Hazlitt. You know, like the likes of Eve Simpson and, you know, Ideal Malloy are dispensed with. You know, even Grady barely appears. I think he appears like one time in the final four seasons. I, I think these seasons are pretty bad, to be honest. They don't hold my attention at all. And season 12, the final season, is a total train wreck. You know, CBS was very clearly trying to kill the show by moving its time slot to an unfavorable position so the ranks would flop and they could cancel it. It aired for the first, you know, 11 seasons on Sundays at 8, but season 12 was moved to Thursdays at 8 against Friends and NBC's, you know, Thursday night lineup, which was insanely popular. And even though the show had declined in quality, it was still doing very well in the ratings. But still, even beyond that, this episode's season's episodes are pretty lackluster as a whole. I mean, the obvious notable standout is the episode Murder Among Friends, which is very clearly bashing the series Friends, 
which is largely the show blamed for killing off Murder, She Wrote. And this episode's not even like a thinly veiled hit job on Friends. There's no veil at all. And this series finale is an okay episode, but it's called Death by Demographics. Again, the title, a very obvious reference to CBS moving the time slots around. The show doesn't have like a definitive series finale. It's just like a regular episode with it's fine it's not great it's not bad i guess it's one of the better episodes from the season you know <laughs> but the writers really did not hold back their feelings for this season but again the final season largely pretty bad as well not very memorable episodes some of them are really boring that are difficult to watch i tune out when i want whenever they're on tv if i'm watching it Angela Lansbury was nominated for 12 consecutive best actress drama emmy awards and never once won. This is by far the record for most consecutive nominations, I believe, ever, and is certainly without a win, and I can't imagine this would be broken anytime soon. She did win four Golden Globes for the same category, but lost six. The show itself won two Golden Globes for Best Drama. It was nominated for Best Drama three times at the Emmys and lost all of them. And I do sort of get it. I mean, the acting on this show, you know, isn't like top tier. And I don't think the mysteries themselves are top tier. You know, they could get corny and simple, but they're always a lot of fun, especially for the first like seven or eight seasons, at least. I mentioned this already, but I do think the plots aren't really the most creative or complex. The show had a habit of like zooming in on very obvious clues. Actors, when their characters would drop a clue in dialogue, would ov often overemphasize those important words and dramatic music sometimes played. You know, I found the names of the characters to be odd at times, and they felt made up and not names people would actually have. I know that's like an odd criticism. And the show did have a problem with continuity and factual information you know i don't think the mechanics were highly researched at all there's a lot of just like incorrect information presented as fact you know i already mentioned the odd episode where jessica was appointed to the house of representatives that's the most glaring episode you know jessica goes abroad a lot and oftentimes you can tell that she's not actually abroad this is a film studio a film set there's not a lot of like you know people driving on the wrong side of the road things like that this should be like in hong kong and everything's in english at times yeah i do think this is a very common issue for the show unfortunately but none of this like really matters to me in an episode of television it would in a novel and i will i will get there shortly but overall i love this show i have fond memories of watching reruns of the show especially with my grandmother who passed away earlier this year a couple of years ago she came down with a little bit of dementia and would sometimes get agitated or anxious and i would sit and watch murder she wrote with her and she would follow along and it would calm her down it would be on for hours like on the hallmark channel or one of those stations and it was comforting for me because i knew she would like it and it would comfort her and it would work her brain and she would actually be able to follow along and solve some of the mysteries and it made her feel good you know her favorite episode was the magnum bi crossover because she was absolutely in love with tom Selleck, and she would also try to ship jessica off with dr hazlitt which i always found really funny Murder, She Wrote spawned other media after the series ended. Most notably, there are four TV movies. They were called South by Southwest in 1997, A Story to Die For in 2000, The Last Free Man in 2001, and The Celtic Riddle in 2003. I'm going to be honest, I have no recollection of the first two. I'm sure I've watched them before, but I simply don't recall them. I do recall The Last Free Man, but I don't remember my opinion of it. And I did like the Celtic Riddle. I believe these are also readily available to watch. They're probably a little bit harder to find than the series is, but I have seen them airing on TV. There were also two video games, which I did play a long time ago. They were fine, nothing extraordinary at all. To be honest, I don't really remember them either. There was a board game, apparently. I did not know about this until I researched it for this video, so I can't give any commentary on how that was. And for years after the show ended, Angela Lansbury expressed a desire to return as Jessica Fletcher, but it never happened before she passed, and she eventually decided that she was simply too old to be Jessica, and she didn't want Jessica to be portrayed as old as Lansbury was. 
There was a reboot attempt made, which would have starred Octavia Spencer as Jessica Fletcher, but the plans were shelved after Angela Lansbury and the public expressed their disapproval of this and their opinion that only Angela Lansbury could be Jessica Fletcher. The idea was not well received, so the project was shelved. With no disrespect to Aunt Octavia Spencer, Angela Lansbury did praise her quite a bit, but really, as she did not approve of a reboot without her. If only we could nix all of these reboots that are popping up. Uh, there's also a Murder, She Wrote film in the works that was announced last year or two. Uh, there's really been no further inf- developments on that, so who knows what's going on there. Maybe that was shelved too. I have no idea. But one piece of media regarding Murder, She Wrote that is still active and ongoing is the book series, which debuted in 1989 when the series was still airing and at its height. And I'm going to go through these books in sort of like errors, because there's like almost 60 of them, and I would be here all day if I went through book by book, but they basically follow the same trajectory as the series, and I'm going to be honest, these books are by and large not great. Some are better than others for sure, and you may be wondering why I'm still reading them 58 books later, but 58, that is how many are published, and a 59th is coming out next week at the time of recording this video, and it's because I hate leaving a collection incomplete, and I use these books basically as like palate cleansers to break up some other reading I'm doing. None of these books are like top 200, 300, 400, 500 mystery novels of all time. They're fine if you want like a quick read that isn't serious or profound, but I just find like most modern day mystery novels, these do not satisfy me with any type of interesting puzzle or mystery or mechanics or characters. They don't do any of that. You know, I would probably disagree with the general opinion that these are cozy mysteries. As you may remember, I am not a fan of cozy mysteries for various reasons I've discussed already. I have a very specific definition of cozy that is less broad than people typically use. Certainly, the more recent books in this series are cozy, and no coincidence, those are the worst of the bunch, but I'll, I'll get there. And I should say, the books do include most of the characters from the television series. Jessica is obviously there, Dr. Hazlitt and Mort Metzger, I believe, are in every book, and even if Jessica's not in Cavett Cove, they at least, like, call her on the phone or something. They, they show their face. And the other characters, like Grady, like Donna, like Eve Simpson, they appear occasionally. Even, like, a Harry McGraw shows up. There are also new recurring characters, most notably is Maureen Metzger, who is Mort's second wife. His TV wife, Adele, divorced him because she hated Cavett Cove. So Maureen is the second wife, who's a really bad cook. And there's Mara, who owns the luncheonette, and Sassy, who owns the bakery. There's Maeve, who is this recent addition, who is Jessica's neighbor. You know, unlike the TV series, I find the books set in Cabot Cove tend to be the worse than the ones set elsewhere, because there's a lot of, like, checking in with all these recurring characters and not a lot going on in them. All right, let's get into the books, because when else am I going to talk about these? these? This is primarily a literary channel. The original author was Donald Bain, who was a travel writer. His famous book was Coffee, Tea, or Me, which is a really, like, tawdry peek into the airline industry. He also goes wrote, like, Margaret Truman novels after she passed away. I should say all the books are credited as written by Jessica Fletcher and whatever author actually wrote the book. They are all first-person narrated by Jessica. Donald Bain wrote 47 novels. 46 whole books, and one finished posthumously by someone else. And I find Bain's books to be mostly in line with the series. You know, they varied from book to book, the type of mystery. Sometimes they were puzzles, sometimes they were grittier, sometimes they were thrillers. They were hit or miss in quality-wise, and as time went on, the TV series ended. Bain did start to, like, deviate away from this very nature into more like typical mysteries that lacked any substance just like the episodes did it's amazing how this trajectory really parallel each other here again i'm not going book by book i'll be here forever but i'll take them in sort of bunches 
the first five books were title themed or with like an alcohol and a weapon like gin and daggers or manhattans and murders these would be books one through five and i've only read each of these books only once or in rare cases less than once but i distinctly remember these naming themes being joked at in these books as being silly and for the most part these felt very much like the episodes you know gin and daggers was jessica in england solving the murder of a fellow mystery writer that she was in new york and manhattan's and murder in the caribbean and cabot cove etc etc and donald bain because he was a travel writer doesn't do a good job in depicting the setting of these different locales it does get a bit travel loggy at times but i will say unlike future writers bain is always focused on the murder plot he rarely goes off on tangents on irrelevant matters. You know, later on, he, he sort of does. I suspect as his health declined, his writing became more difficult for him, especially the pacing. When I, he first published Gin and Daggers, he clearly had not watched the show before as Jessica was doing like all these things she never did in the show, like driving. And the book was republished with corrections made years later. Most notably, Jessica gets her pilot's license, and she meets the British police inspector named George Sutherland, whom she usually meets up with whenever she's in England. He's sort of a love interest for her. I mean, not really. It's much in the same way Irene Adler is to Sherlock Holmes in that there's this flirtation, and everybody like assumes they're a couple, but it never really goes anywhere. I would consider the second batch of novels to be books 6 through 16, starting with A Deadly Judgment and ending with Murder in a Minor Key, which is also the name of an episode. And these mostly continue on like the TV series. Like, I could see these being episodes of the show. In fact, many of them seemed inspired by episodes. We have Jessica helping a lawyer with jury selection, investigating witches, going to the theater, all things she did in multiple episodes. Again, these plots varied. You know, I have to call out some books in this bunch. Murder in Moscow is awful. The solution is not given. Do not read it. I feel obligated to tell people that it's not good anyway. Murder on the QE2 begins <laughs> Jessica's like preachy arc. She gets like very obnoxious at times. Like I remember in this book specifically, she scolds a lot of people for calling a boat trip a cruise instead of a cross it gets really obnoxious after like the first chapter and I think the quality of the back end of this bunch is pretty bad like Donald Bain was sort of struggling to think of decent plots and ideas and it very much feels that way this next group is like the zenith of the series and by zenith I mean like the best part of the series but you know it's still like an anthill compared to like the mountains of most other mystery authors these would be books 17 through 20, and I just found these books to have more substance than usual, and they never would get like this again. I mean, to be fair, individual books might later on, but not in terms of like a series here. You know, I, I think this is peak murder she wrote literature. I don't think these are like all-time great novels. They, they were decently written, had entertaining mysteries, and at least were suspenseful at times, you know. I guess to call out here destination murder is really funny where Jessica just like randomly screams murder when a man starts coughing which was really funny to me of course she's right but just like why is she calling out murder here when the man coughed the next batch of books however I, I think begin to sort of move away from the tv series the show had been over for nearly a decade at this point I think with distance from the show the book sort of took a life on their own I don't think these books are good there's definitely a lull here uh, these would be books 21 through 32, and I think these books are just either boring or, like, outright bad or ridiculous. The main mutiny is worth calling out here. It has a ridiculous scene that's repeated, repeated verbatim twice of Jessica being dumped in the middle of the ocean and swimming back to shore, which was really absurd. A Fatal Feast is another book I should warn potential readers about. This book has a red herring plot that takes up most of the novel that is exactly the same plot as a minor event in a previous book. It's exactly the same thing where Jessica receives strange letters in the mail, and by letters I mean like literal letters like G and L. This exact same thing happened in another novel. It was dumb there. It's dumber here. But and there are one or two decent ones in this batch. You know, a slang in Savannah, I think, is in contention for best of the book series. But I mean, again, this batch is pretty lackluster overall. The next batch is books 33 through 41. And this is a bit of a renaissance for the series also a bit of a mixed bag uh the quality varies a lot here in which there are more better ones but 
also some pretty bad ones as well. It's very much a mixed bag, but the reason why I separated these books from the previous ones is because I think by this point, the books had firmly separated themselves and took on their own universe much more independently from the TV series. Jessica's still solving all these different types of mysteries and going to different places, but there's a feel to these books that are totally detached from the TV series. The original recurring characters are becoming much more prominent. The returning recurring characters like Seth and Moore have a little bit of different personalities than they did on the show. I don't mean to say they're like totally different, but the book universe is now a ways away from the television universe. And I think in this batch, like Nashville Noir and Trouble at High Tide are decent. Uh, Fine Art of Murder is really, really bad. It's terrible. It's in consideration for one of the worst by Donald Bain that doesn't have like serious like fair play issues like not telling you the solution or things like that. Uh, in general, the plots here are not original or inspired. You know, I fear Bain's age was creeping up on him at this point. And the final batch of Donald Bain books includes books 42 through 46, which he co-wrote with his wife, Renee Paley Bain, although she's only credited on some of these. She died in 2016, and Bain followed the next year, so these are their last books. And these do start getting cozier a bit. The, the writing gets daydreamy. The mystery plotting just isn't there. You know, my biggest criticism of cozy mysteries is how bad the mysteries tend to be. There aren't any clues. The murder is just sort of like resolved at the end by means other than actually solving it. And there's a lot of wasted text on tangential things and checking in with recurring characters and oh what Jessica had for breakfast and the actual murder plot is like a quarter of the book and this will get worse with a certain future author these books are not great they are readable I mean they're not like torturous to get through you know I would only recommend reading them though if you're a serious completionist like I am which is the only reason why I'm still torturing myself with these books and after Donald Bain passed, John Land took over the series. And John Land is a very good author. I do enjoy his novels. But his mysteries tend to be a little more action-packed, a little edgier, a little grittier than uh, what I think the series is used for. I don't think this was he was a good match as an author for these books. These are novels 47 through 52. And longtime fans hated these books, which meant I actually liked them because these were full mysteries. No coziness. These were mystery novels from beginning to end in the traditional sense. No fooling around with things I didn't care about. These had clues and character development. However, these are really seriously flawed that if I were to rank all of these books... These would be near the bottom because they have glaring, unforgivable issues. First of all, Date for Murder is atrociously bad, where Jessica joins a dating website and her house burns down, which is a plot that lasts for several books. And to be fair, this book was partially written by Donald Bain for a past, but you can tell which parts John Land wrote for sure. Murder in Red is really bad. I don't know how this book got past through editors, very clearly landed zero research on diabetes as Dr. Hazlitt does not know the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. It's very bad. I have a friend who is a diabetic nurse, and I double-checked with her to make sure this was I was right and this book was horribly wrong, and she was just like screaming at what was written in this book. It was so egregiously false. A Time for Murder and The Murder of Twelve are actually very good until you get to the end of the book where... The murderer is someone who barely appeared in the book, and in the case of the latter, didn't even appear at all until the end. You know, it's extremely frustrating when that happens, especially when the book was so good and just a colossal letdown at the end. Murder of Twelve also has a very offensive portrayal of a little person. This book was published in 2020. I have no idea how that got passed through editors. There's no excuse for such a portrayal. And the murder of 12, you know, also screams like fangirling for and then there were none, which was way too over the top. But I did find the plots of those books to be at least good, despite their unsatisfactory endings. Murder in Season, however, I think is the best novel in the entire series. It has that good mystery to it without these other, like, awful flaws of John Land's other books. And one last thing here is that John Land clearly did not read Donald Bain's books as he creates odd continuity errors at times, including the most egregious one of having Mort's wife be Adele again and not Maureen, although he does fix that. And the trio of Jessica, Seth, and Mort 
which is a very strong friendship, or they're, like, really mean to each other in his books. It's very odd, but again, he fixes that as well over time. And the final batch we have are books 53 to the present, currently at 58, although 59 is debuting soon at the time of this recording. And these are written by Terry Farley Moran, who... Oh boy, this is going to sound mean, but uh, she's not a good writer. Uh, There are basic, fundamental writing issues here. I think these largely stem from the fact that she publishes, like, at least, like, five books a year under different series. I mean, she's just churning out these books with no care or attention. You cannot write this many books in a year and have them be halfway decent. You just can't. Agatha Christie only did three a year at most, and she's Agatha Christie. And Moran's books are overly cozy. I mean, there's like 10% of the book dedicated to the mystery. And the rest is Jessica shopping and Jessica eating breakfast with Seth and Jessica sightseeing and Jessica fawning over Grady's son Frank, who is obnoxious as anything. And these books are very long and there's just no content to them. They're 250 pages of just words. And one of the, in one of these, Jessica says something like, oh, I guess I better start investigating. And I'm like, yeah, you should, because this book is like 80% finished since she did nothing. And none of these books are any good. And the most recent one called Murder Backstage, I couldn't even finish. It was so bad, I couldn't. And if you know me, I never not finish a novel. I always chug through it. I, I just couldn't. And the first half was Jessica and her friends traveling around Montreal, and nothing was going on. And the most frustrating things about these books, which is certainly hard to pick just one thing, is that Moran is always focusing on Jessica's writing process, and I just can't help but to wonder if she follows any of her own advice. Like, I don't think she understands the first thing about mystery writing, never mind writing in general. And I know this sounds harsh, but... As a commentator on these things, I feel obligated to state my feelings. I'm not someone who's going to heap false praise on books that don't deserve it. I feel like I owe my listeners to be honest about my feelings on these things. I'm not going to say good things about books I have nothing good to say about just for the sake of being polite. I have no idea if I'm going to continue reading this series or not. It's up in the air. Moran does have book 59, but book 60 is going to a different author named Barbara Early, who I never heard of before, and after researching her, I don't feel at all confident I will like her books. She writes cozy murders set in bridal shops, which sounds exactly like the kind of books I have no interest in. And from what I understand, um, Moran and Early are going to, like, alternate books, so, like, they'll each have one a year instead of, like, having two a year by Moran. I don't really know how it's going to work out, but Moran isn't leaving the series, unfortunately. Um, we'll see how it goes. Again, can't guarantee I'm going to read any more. The last book really pushed me, but again, we'll see. And that is it for this video. I am open to covering more television and film series, but I don't I do want to remain primarily a literary channel. I'm open to doing things like a top 10 episodes of Murder, She Wrote video. I'm open to like covering films that aren't adaptations of books. We'll see. I know Clue, the movie, is celebrating its 40th anniversary next year, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. So I think you can expect a uh, review of that at the time. But let me know what you think. I'm sure you all love this show as much as I do. I've never really heard anyone say they don't like Murder, She Wrote. But next week is the follow-up to my popular video on whether or not Miss Marple could solve Poirot's cases. It's whether or not Poirot could solve Miss Marple's cases. So stay tuned for that. Until next time, Mystery Files.